it's so good to hear some wisdom coming from Europe because unfortunately the dominant discourse in Europe is like the dominant discourse in the United States uh, these days, which is uh, war all the time. And um, I've always counted on Europe to be smarter than the US on these matters because the US makes so many of these uh, awful, uh, unnecessary wars. Um, and I've been surprised and very, uh, very alarmed and disappointed by uh, the European leaders falling into line with the uh, US military industrial complex. And um, Claire, thank you. <laughs> it's just so, <coughs> so good to hear uh, your, uh, your wonderful remarks. It's gotten very bad uh, in Europe, as it has in the United States, very hard to reach the mainstream because the media, the corporate media have completely, completely blocked out any honest accounting of uh, how we got into the Ukraine war and what's happening and why it's a disaster. So it's very hard to uh, to to uh, even uh, share basic facts right now. I, I know I was pretty frequently on uh, just normal mainstream TV, but not these days, not in the last couple of years, because uh, nobody wants to hear. And I, I begged the New York Times even for one editorial to tell the truth about this war and I kind of badgered them into accepting something and they accepted it, they edited it, they were getting ready to print it. And then they said, oh, I'm so sorry, Professor Sachs, we're not going to run it after all. Uh, so the, the fact of the matter is uh, the, the corporate mainstream media has, is just completely saturated with the US government propaganda. So. With that backdrop, here we are uh, sharing some truth and sharing some thoughts together. Uh, I go back uh, more than 30 years uh, in Russia, Ukraine, uh, US, European issues, because more than 30 years ago, I was uh, trying to help uh, President Gorbachev, uh, and then trying to help President Yeltsin, and then trying to help President Kuchma, the first president of independent Ukraine to uh, uh, overcome all of the uh, huge difficulties that attended the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union collapsed because it was a miserable system. It didn't work. Uh, and uh, Gorbachev knew it, and he wanted a normal society with normal relations with the US and he wanted a common European home and I loved the man for it. And when he asked me to be on his uh, advisory team, of course, I said yes. And I learned that the United States could not take yes for an answer. It could not accept the idea of just a normal cooperative relationship with a reformed Soviet Union or with an independent Russia. Uh, the US wanted unipolarity. The US wanted dominance. Uh, the US wants its way <coughs> on everything. It's crazy. We're 4.2% of the world. We don't and can't and shouldn't aspire to run the world. We should aspire to cooperate. Well, I, I saw firsthand in a very painful few years that the US doesn't like cooperation. First, it was uh, the Bush senior administration. Well, that was Cheney and Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld, the, uh, the neocons of the day. And uh, they basically didn't want to lift one finger to help the transformation of Russia into a new, uh, independent state that was peacefully integrated with its neighbors. Of course, they told lies. Uh, Gorbachev unilaterally said that he would disband the Soviet military alliance, the Warsaw Pact. 
and James Baker III, our Secretary of State at the time, and Hans Dietrich Genscher, the Foreign Minister of Germany, ran to Gorbachev, if you do this, uh, we will absolutely not take advantage of uh, the Soviet Union. We will absolutely uh, not move NATO into where the Warsaw Pact is right now. We will not move NATO one inch eastward. And there's a massive, wonderful archive of material with this promise repeated many times to Gorbachev by the Germans, by the US, by the Secretary General of NATO uh, himself uh, to a visiting Russian delegation. Well, turned out all to be lies because as soon as the Soviet Union uh, dissolved at the end of 1991, the neocons started planning the expansion of NATO because they couldn't take yes for an answer that we should just have peace and cooperation. They needed the expansion. And, and who championed the expansion? Of course, the military industrial complex led the lobbying. And it's not even subtle. Uh, the Raytheon top lobbyist was the head of the committee for the expansion of NATO. Well, duh, this was <coughs> money. We can sell weapons. We can expand our military bases. We can expand our military budget. And of course, these neocons had the idea that they would make several wars of choice. They actually decided that already in the 1990s that there would be several wars of choice because there was no one to oppose it so uh, the u.s could depose all of the governments that were still aligned with russia that means uh, the syrian government the libyan government uh, the uh, saddam hussein and so forth and they would find whatever excuse whatever lies uh, whatever alleged provocations to launch wars of choice and of course we know that this happened. But the real origin of the Ukraine war was this relentless NATO march eastward, <laughs> despite the core promises that were made and the core common sense, by the way, not just the promises. Why provoke Russia? And when Clinton actually started the, uh, the the machinery of NATO enlargement, his own Secretary of Defense, William Perry, thought about resigning in protest because he thought it was such a terrible idea that this would just lead to a new Cold War just at the time that relations were being normalized. And our top diplomats knew this. They understood this. Uh, Jack Matlock, the uh, US ambassador to the Soviet Union said, don't expand NATO. You said no, and it's only gonna provoke. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh God, I get choked up over this. George Kennan, our top historian diplomat, the, the, the person who invented containment, that concept of the 1940s, he never wanted to be militarized in this way. And he absolutely said, this is the biggest mistake imaginable to start expanding NATO. Well, I watched a lot of this pretty close up. Uh, Clinton, kind of as usual, uh, not thinking very much, very short term thinking, uh, started uh, the NATO expansion in the 1990s. That was to Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic. The Russians were very unhappy, but it wasn't a big crisis. It wasn't on their border. Then Bush Jr. comes in, all the wars of choice. And not to mention, by the way, in 1999, Clinton bombs, and not Clinton only, NATO bombs Belgrade for six straight weeks. Not exactly to Russia's liking, absolutely horrible and uh, that worsened the relations further then in 2002 the neocons under bush jr call for the unilateral u.s withdrawal from the anti-ballistic missile treaty unbelievable 
the Russians said, stop, don't do this. This puts us in a threat. This destabilizes the <coughs> nuclear deterrence, which is our basis for just peacefully being able to trust each other and keeping on a path of denuclearization. Well, the US unilaterally withdraws and starts planning for placing missiles near Russia. And the Aegis missiles go into Poland and Romania within the next decade. Well, oh, the Russians are really getting pretty upset about this. And then George W. expands NATO to seven more countries in 2007. The three Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, and Slovenia. And Putin goes to the Munich Security Summit in 2007 and says, come on, stop, stop. You promised not one inch eastward, and now it's 10 countries you've expanded to. So the US in its uh, infinite wisdom as usual, what does it do? The next year, George W. Bush Jr. with, by the way, our U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Victoria Newland. I hope that name rings a bell. She's currently our Deputy Secretary of State. They call for NATO to enlarge further and where to the 2000 kilometer border with Russia, Ukraine, and to Georgia. Georgia, not the state, Georgia, the country on the eastern edge of the Black Sea. Look at a map, it ain't a North Atlantic country. But what it is, is a plan to surround Russia in the Black Sea. Because the idea was, and it was a very premeditated US idea, that with NATO enlargement, <coughs> NATO would be in Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey and Georgia, completely surrounding Russia in the Black Sea. And notably, Russia's naval base in Sevastopol. And that was the idea. That, by the way, was the same idea of Lord Palmerston in 1853. So it's not a very original idea. It was the whole basis of the first Crimean War. And so these neocons wanted to fight the second Crimean War. And of course, you could hear the cheers of Britain, which is uh, imperialist nostalgia to the essence uh, in its political class. Yes, yes, yes. We could surround Russia and the Black Sea, just like Lord Palmerston wanted to do a century and a half earlier. Well, Putin says, do not do this. This could be incredibly destabilizing. But by the way, it wasn't just Putin who sent a secret memo back from Moscow to Washington to Condoleezza Rice. Well, of course, none other than Bill Burns. Bill Burns was then the US ambassador to Russia. But you may recall the name. He's currently our CIA director. And he sent a secret memo, because everything in the US government is secret, by the way. He sent a secret memo entitled, Nyet means Nyet. And he explained, <laughs> he explained something so basic, so obvious, that for Russia, this is a absolute hardcore bright red line, do not go to Ukraine. And that it's not just Putin, it's the entire Russian society. They don't want the US military bases. They don't want Aegis missiles. They do not want to be crowded on their border by the US military. And it makes perfect sense because we wouldn't like it either. But, you know, Americans are American, not Americans, American security state leaders who don't ask us Americans, they're a little hard of hearing. So uh, did you say red line? We didn't hear that. So of course, Bush pushes through the commitment by NATO to expand 
to Ukraine and to Georgia. I know European leaders told me in 2008, what is your president doing? But Europe, you know, they're, <coughs> I don't get it exactly, but they will not oppose the US in public. So they complained to me, but then they, in the end, signed on to Bush's crazy idea of expanding NATO to Ukraine and to Georgia. Now, there was one last safety valve to understand in this, and that is the Ukrainians did not want this. Ukraine is a divided society, ethnically Ukrainian, ethnically Russian. They didn't want this crowding. They knew that this would destabilize the situation. So the elected president, Viktor Yanukovych, said, we will be neutral. We will not alarm Russia also. We'll extend a lease in Crimea for the Sevastopol naval fleet until 2042. We want quiet. The United States neocons don't like quiet. They, do, they want just to get their way. So in the end of 2013, they helped stoke first protests against Yanukovych, and then the violent overthrow of Yanukovych in February 2014. And we know that Victoria Nuland and Jake Sullivan and Joe Biden all played a role in the violent overthrow of the Ukrainian president. That's just a fact. Now, so much is hidden from view that we don't know exactly time and date, but the Russians intercepted one of Victoria Newland's phone calls and posted it on YouTube so everybody can listen to it as she and the US ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Piat, plot the next post Yanukovych government several weeks before a violent storming of the government buildings in Kiev. That's what happened. That's when the war started. We overthrew the government that wanted stability. And in came a series of governments that were Russophobic and pro-NATO and at the American <coughs> service. And Obama and Trump and Biden pumped in arms. Now, just to finalize uh, how we came to this current utter, utter tragedy and disaster. When Biden came in, I had hopes, okay, maybe something rational. No way. Biden doubled down on Ukraine becoming a NATO member, doubled down repeatedly in 2021, said NATO will enlarge to Ukraine. And on December 17th, 2021, Putin really at wit's end because he could not get the US to engage in diplomacy, put on the table, and you can find it on the internet, a draft US-Russia security agreement to avert a war. And at the time, the security <coughs> agreement said, don't expand NATO. Don't put your missiles close to our borders and implement the Minsk II agreement, which is a United Nations Security Council backed agreement for autonomy of the Russian speaking regions in the east of Ukraine, which the Ukrainian nationalists blew off and the United States said, yeah, don't worry about it. You don't have to follow through on a UN Security Council agreement. And Putin said, honor that agreement. Well, the basic story is, of course, the US refused to negotiate on these points. And on February 21st, 2022, there was a Russian Security Council meeting. You can find the minutes online again in the Russian government in English transcription or translation. President Putin calls on the foreign minister, <coughs> Sergei Lavrov, Minister Lavrov, give us a report on your 
diplomatic initiatives uh, in regard to our security. And Lavrov says, the United States has formally notified us that the NATO enlargement issue is non-negotiable, that it's none of our business. That was the final step before the Russian invasion on February 24th. We rejected every single diplomatic chance to avoid a war. And we thought, okay, our wonderful weapons and our, uh, our financial sanctions uh, will do Russia in. And by the way, you know, if I've been observing these kinds of things for 40 years. I wrote an article, it was, uh, I think, in June, actually. So it was a couple months after this saying that these neocon ploys are doomed to fail. The sanctions aren't going to kill the Russian economy. The, the wonder weapons are not going to defeat uh, Russia and so forth. So obvious. So obvious if you've seen this uh, particular show repeatedly, as we have all the promises of our generals and the military industrial complex and all the rest, wrong again and again and again. But what we did do was trap Ukraine in a devastating war between the US and Russia. So we provide the weapons, we provide, and I'll put it in quotation marks, the intelligence, because it's not very intelligent intelligence. And we tell them, run to the front lines. And tens of thousands of Ukrainians have died just in recent weeks <coughs> because of this. <coughs> An absolutely predictable bloodbath. And when the Ukrainians tried to negotiate with the Russians in March 2022, just after the start of the invasion, the US stopped the negotiations. And when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, said last fall, you know, maybe this is the time to negotiate. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who steps up? Secretary Newland, the endless neocon. Doesn't matter whether she's working for Cheney, whether she's working for Hillary, whether she's working for Biden, she's the perpetual neocon. She says, no, no, the time's not right for negotiations. What is the subtext of that? Well, a lot more Ukrainians have to die. And that's where we are right now. And this administration doesn't know what to do because all its great plans backfired, but Biden doesn't want to look weak. He's, you know, facing an election next year. So as usual, they just tell the Ukrainians, just keep running into the Russian lines. Just keep dying. It is the cliche fight to the last Ukrainian. And we even have senators like Romney say, you know, this is great. What's the problem? No Americans are dying. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what Romney says and what a lot of American leaders are saying. Yeah, we could put in $100 billion. What, what is that among friends in the military industrial complex? Of course, it means a lot to Americans who might care about their sustenance. But what they really think is, yeah, if the Ukrainians are ready to die for this, it, weak it weakens Russia and so forth. <coughs> and that's where we are till now. So my conclusion, we could have avoided this war entirely. We could have avoided loss of territory. We could have avoided everything because there was no demand for any of this until the US pushed and pushed and pushed and is tone deaf, can't hear anyone else, doesn't believe anyone has red lines except the United States, and is on the path to do the same thing with Taiwan right now. And that's the war talk. So we're not out of this by any means. We're still in the midst of this neocon dominated American foreign policy. It it's what Kissinger famously said to be, to be a, a foe of the United States is dangerous, but to be a friend is fatal. So we embrace our friends like Ukraine to the point of their destruction. And now we're angling or threatening or escalating in our tensions with China for a war 
over Taiwan. Unbelievable. I was just in Taiwan a couple of weeks ago. What a wonderful and beautiful place and very successful. And we are stoking a crisis by feeding it with armaments. So sorry to have talked so long, uh, but thank you for being the voices for peace and sanity and rationality in this country. Biden's asked for another 20 plus billion. This is our moment to say, stop, stop it already. Your reelection actually, Mr. Biden, doesn't count compared to the lives you are wasting, the tens of thousands who will die because you don't want an embarrassment on your watch. It's not going to help your campaign to be in a war next year. Nobody wants this in the United States. We don't like this. This is dangerous. This is unnecessary. We don't support you, Mr. President in this. So stop now. It'll be a lot worse in your campaign. The whole concept that you have to look tough and strong for your 2024 uh, 2024 re-election is a nonsense and it's profoundly immoral. So we need to raise our voice now. I think more and more congressmen and senators are getting the idea that while they don't ask us our opinions in the United States about these issues, because it's not really about what Americans think. It's about what the military industrial complex demands. We don't like it one bit.